If you know your way around Boston, you certainly know the figures who go down in history, the leaders, the legends, and the bad guys. And the city's notorious for its boundaries with antagonism barely held in check. But the city's also about connections that cross the boundaries, if sometimes with great difficulty and stumbling along the way. In Jonathan Baker's house on Lime Street, there's a good deal of stumbling, but the story's mainly about getting back on one's feet. We'd like to welcome the author and lifelong Boston resident, Neil Savage. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Neil. Thank you for having me. Neil, this is your first novel, but not your first book, so talk about what you did before and how you got around to doing this. Oh, well, I uh, mo wrote mostly history. Yeah, I wrote history of, uh, of Boston institutions like the Forest Hill Cemetery, which is very beautiful, very interesting story. A lot of famous people buried there, like uh, Edward Everett and, and Eugene O'Neill. And then I wrote a history of the Boston water and sewer system and how they bought an adequate supply of pure water from Colvin into Boston. It was quite an engineering feat. And then I did some uh, pro bono work on churches that had the centennials and things like that. But I always wanted to write a novel, so I thought I'd sit down and write it, which I did. So w why did you write about the kind of people? Talk about the kind of people in this novel, because uh, these, these are not your famous Boston gangsters no, or, or no, politicians. No, no, no. We didn't get to the gangsters, so it won't be a right. movie. Right. Um, actually, uh, uh, Jonathan Baker lives on Lime Street, which is in the backside of Beacon Hill. And he's from an old Yankee family. He goes way back to the, well, his uh, forebears came over and with the, <coughs> excuse me, the Puritans, and one of them was the Beatle of the Great and General Court of the Massachusetts Bay of New England, the Massachusetts Legislature. The Beatle was the Sergeant at Arms. So his family's been here for years and years, and years and years. And um, his wife, uh, Constance, is kind of a people collector. Uh, they have a beautiful library in the house in Lime Street. And she invites different types of people in, usually people that are in trouble one way or the other. And through the associations in there and other people's help and so forth, most of the people get back on their feet or, as I put, um, reach the, from the depths, they reach the top of the mountain. So. Now, one thing I, I, I picked up on the book, uh, there was one episode about uh, the early years of desegregation, and there was a lot of uh, red tape and organizational people tying themselves in knots. Yeah. And you might have done some of that yourself <laughs> back in the 70s. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that worked out in the book. Uh, well, uh, my wife and I had children of school age during that time, and we decided to keep them in the school system. And uh, Judge Garrity uh, decreed that every school should have a racial ethnic parents council, one black, one white, one Spanish speak person. So I was the uh, white uh, parent in a Mary E. Curley school in Jamaica Plain. But, so I wrote about that experience, but I did it in a comical manner. I made it kind of funny, you know, because uh, the uh, white person of the multiracial officer, the white parent, his, name's, his, name, his first name is Florence, which is most people would consider a female name, but actually it's a male name too. Like, uh, for instance, uh, the great comedian Fred Allen, who was from Somerville's name, <coughs> a name was Flor who was from Somerville's name was Florence Sullivan. But anyway, f so what happens is they their school has been all the athletic equipment has been taken out of the school by the school committee to put in a new junior high school that they built, they thought, to get around Garrity. Or a flag. Or, right? Right? So they set out to get them back, and he sets out because he's the corresponding secretary for the Racial Ethnic Council. He gets started by addressing the general court. And first of all, the general court keeps, I mean the court, Judge Garrity's court, at the federal court, and uh, first of all, there's a lot of confusion about his name because the Judge's clerk keeps addressing him as, mi as, as, as Mrs. or Miss, and he gets, but anyway, it goes on and on, and, uh, and the correspondence between the two, and then he, politicians get in, and the correspondence between, so most people who've read it think it's yeah, kind of humorous. Now, uh, the uh, Jonathan Baker circle, uh, to use some shorthand here, got involved in this, but uh, what you also see in the book, um, more than anything else, is how this book helps people 
who are really um, hitting the bottom. Yeah. Talk about one of those cases. I think the priest, Kiernan uh, Riley, was. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Father Kiernan Riley is uh, is having trouble with his vocation. He's uh, he's gay, and of course that's just anathema at that time. Uh, anyway, of being homosexual is anathema in the church. And uh, actually, he finds his redemption because um, he gets acquainted with this uh, this uh, Jewish doctor, uh, and who is running a clinic for AIDS patients at the initial stages of the AIDS of a, AIDS epidemic in a, in a uh, isolation ward in Boston City Hospital, because at that time. They were, uh, the victims of AIDS were really isolated in that even some of the medical profession wouldn't go near them. So he helps them. He stays with the patients. He helps them. He, they're all in there to die. Yeah. And, and, of course, this priest is struggling with his own alcoholism. And he struggled with his alcoholism. And uh, so, actually, through helping these people through the last stages of their life, he actually... Uh, regains his vocation and saves his priesthood. This is a, a part of Boston, you know, you could say, oh, someone has a substance abuse problem and there's a little story about it, and you think of it as something isolated, but if you go around the city, if, if you go to the meetings uh, in the churches, Alcoholics Anonymous, we're talking about huge numbers of people, really. This is not a story that, that's out of the blue, in a way. A substantial number of people. And... Uh, and a lot of them, uh, the majority of them, find the sobriety in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. But the, the lesson from this book here, it's not just that you go to a meeting and follow a formula. You, you need more than that, and this, it, as your book points yeah, out. Yeah. yeah, you need the motivation, and you need to stick to it, and you need surrender more than anything. These guys, all these people surrender to their problem rather than just, and, uh, and, and look for spiritual aid, you know, aid. Talk about what that means when, when you surrender, because what comes before the surrender, there's, there's a good deal of denial. Yeah, there's a lot of denial, and uh, most alcoholics, um, from my acquaintance, is um, they reach a bottom. They hit a bottom. There's nothing else they can do. They just, first of all, they don't control their drinking. Their uh, addiction controls their drinking. They have no control over it, so the addiction is taking over. And they get, they get into a, pl a, pl a place of desperation. And many of them then now turn to God, you know, whether they believed in God, they used to be, a lot of them used to be religious, they're no longer religious, but they, they in their desperation, they ask for God's help. And, and uh, most of them, because they're recommended, but somebody else recommends it on their own, they go to AA and, and they're on the road to recovery if they follow the program. By the way, uh, this book is about people who, when, when they hit bottom, they almost have nowhere to go. Some of them are literally on the street. They have no friends or family members who want to have anything to do with them. And then they come into this circle and someone helps them along. Yeah. Do you know, did you ever meet anybody like that in your life or hear about somebody who really <laughs> existed, who, who, who could do things like this? Who, who could help people could help people? Oh, yeah, out? I've known yeah. several who help people. Constance, his wife, uh, Jonathan's wife, is just one of those people, uh, I suppose you could say as, as well as anything else, with a big heart, and she, she seems attracted to these people that need aid, and she invites them in in the calmness of that library, and the, and the other people there have had their problems, and some of them, of course, have conquered their problems, and she, which she had helped, in, and that atmosphere really helps them along to get on their way to, to the top of the mountain from the depths that they are at the time. And it works almost like a chain reaction because it, it's not just people in, in that circle. You have the character Aiden, who was the former uh, newspaper reporter, and uh, you see his wife helping things along, yeah. doing quite a lot. She takes the lead, actually, yeah, I guess, right? she does, yeah. So anyhow, if people want to catch up to this book, where can they go to find some bit more information about it? Well, I have a website uh, called theliteratesavage.com, which I thought was kind of cool. Theliteratesavage.com, and you get all the information you need in the book. And, of course, it's available at Books I Now and, and Amazon or Kindle. 
But if you want to read about the book before you get it, or maybe even get an autographed copy from me, the place to go is the literatesavage.com. Easy to remember. Thank you very much, Neil Savage. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Author of Jonathan Baker's House on Lime Street. We'll have more news after this message. <laughs>